Tonight, the benefits route that took the Conservative government to the brink of civil war. Ian Duncan Smith unexpectedly quit, saying he could take no more. Cuts in disability benefit that the Secretary of State said he couldn't accept. It's damaging to the party uh, and it's actually damaging to the public. The cuts were quickly reversed. But what about the benefit at the heart of this route? Personal independence payment. She's actually worse than she was before, and now you're saying she doesn't meet the criteria. How is that even remotely possible? Tonight, Dispatches is undercover in a £4 billion business which assesses the disabled for benefits. One assessor boasts about the money he's made in the past. Money? It's been a huge political row, but for the disabled, the fallout is all too real. It's the day a confident George Osborne announces his budget to Conservative cheers. Social justice delivered by Conservative means. But just 48 hours later, in Downing Street, the Prime Minister receives a shock. Out of the blue, Ian Duncan Smith, champion of the government's controversial benefit reforms, says enough is enough. The shock move comes after mounting controversy over £4 billion of planned cuts to personal independence payments. The great benefits reformer of the Cameron years tells his colleagues, this was a cut too far, hitting benefits for the disabled to pay for tax cuts for the rich. As it came through in the budget, that is deeply unfair and was perceived to be unfair. And that unfairness is damaging to the government, it's damaging to the party, uh, and it's actually damaging to the public. Within hours, Duncan Smith's replacement hastily suspends the cuts to PIP. As the Prime Minister indicated on Friday, I can tell the House that we will not be going ahead with the changes to PIP that had been put forward. Ian Duncan Smith had created personal independence payment as a new benefit to help disabled people with everyday needs. Over three million people currently claim disability benefits in the UK. The cost is 14 billion pounds. The point about personal independence payment was that it would be closely targeted at those who could prove their need. 35-year-old Sarah has a neurological condition. I have nerve pain and it affects my mobility. I fall over. She was awarded personal independent payment four months ago. She gets £76.20 a week. I first got PIP on the 5th of January this year after taking it to a tribunal, um, and it took 11 months in total to get my case sorted and awarded. I was awarded nine points for daily, which gave me the standard tariff and standard ward for mobility. PIP has allowed me to buy a mobility scooter, um, a wheelchair so that I can get out and about and be independent. I can pay for hydrotherapy and physiotherapy to help build up my stamina and hopefully go back to work. Until recently, people like Sarah and I got a benefit known as disability living allowance. In two years, that will be no more and all of us will have to apply for PIP. This form, all 35 pages of it, is what I or anyone transferring to PIP will have to fill in. And it looks pretty daunting, but I've got the day off, so I'm going to have a go at it. <sighs> PIP is different to the old benefit. My disability used to be assessed by my doctor. The Department of Work and Pensions have hired two big companies to do the job. They assess eligibility for the DWP, who make the final decision. I can imagine some people with mental health conditions like severe depression or anxiety will struggle with that just because of the sheer amount of information that you're expected to gather. Based on the assessments carried out by the private companies, the DWP turned down 52% of all new claims. 
But in the first quarter of this year, 57% of over 7,000 appeals were won by the claimant. Noel Finn is a psychiatric nurse with 15 years' experience. In the past, he exposed abuse at Yarlswood Detention Centre. He's been invited to train as a disability assessor by Capita, a company that won a £140 million contract to carry out PIP assessments in central England, Wales and Northern Ireland. According to Capita's persuasive recruitment video, the job should appeal to a caring health professional like Noel. We're looking for health professionals who are able to undertake a disability assessment. People who actually have an empathy with disabled people, have an understanding and, and a desire uh, to seek to improve the lives of disabled people um, and contribute generally uh, to the change agenda that the uh, the government is pursuing. Noel starts on Capita's 20-day training programme at a hotel in Birmingham. <laughs> the training makes it clear that his relationship with clients will be different to his days as a nurse. But we're not there as clinicians. No. We are there as disability assessors don't give advice or opinions no. on any of the care that they receive or anything like that. You just take their statement, type it down, don't comment. So, so the claimant... Noel isn't sure his professional duty of care is considered relevant. There's a bit of a conflict there because uh, my first um, duty is to the care of the patient. Um, and anyway, I, I, I raised that and they said they would... Um, they would, they would bring it back up. That was two weeks ago. It hasn't been brought back up since. Within the first week, there's a presentation from Capita's chief medical officer. He explains they're under pressure from the DWP to get through assessments. Otherwise, the company loses money. Whilst we are focusing quality, we want to get you to do fantastic reports, which are all well. Um, it's, it's obviously that there has significant the issue we have is, is the amount, so we obviously need to get you to be doing as many assessments in a day as you can possibly manage. And we need the quality to be maintained as well. But if we don't do the correct number of assessments, we will get penalised by the DW. Financially, if we don't get the certain quality, we'll get penalised. And that's unfortunately how the DWP works. But the DWP disagree. They told us they don't pressurise contractors to speed up assessments. PIP assessments are scored using the Department of Work and Pension system of points. You get points based on how well you can do daily activities, like making a meal, getting dressed or having a wash. You get no points if you can do a task well. Sometimes you get maximum points if you can't do any of the tasks at all. You need at least eight points to receive minimum benefit, which is £22 a week. The maximum is £140. It's hard to get this right for physically disabled people. It gets much tougher when you try and assess mental disabilities. And a third of people applying for PIP have mental health issues. Noel is told that these claimants are assessed using a mental state examination, or MSE. This is a very, very shallow assessment on MSE in respect. Of, we're not there to do uh, a... very significant on the other hand. But you can't, it's part of your whole assessment. You're there for 45 minutes, so the MSE is part of that whole assessment. But you're <laughs> not there just to do an MSE. To simplify the MSE test, the assessors use a computer program which generates ready-made phrases. The MSC is dead easy to do. You're with that person for 45 minutes. If you've got four reports to do, you need to get those reports out. You're not going to be wanting to spend time on the MSC. The MSC is very simple. You've got a phrasing tool which is dead easy to use. I could do an MSC just like that. 
showed this footage and the DWP computer program to consultant psychiatrist Dr. Jed Boardman from the Maudsley Hospital. He's one of the experts who've advised the DWP on how to assess the disabled. What they seem to be trying to do was get through an examination very quickly and make their ratings on the basis of a rather, well, superficial um, examination or interview with those uh, claimants. The training did not seem to be fit for purpose, that is, to train people in to do accurate and effective assessments. One person who underwent the mental state exam was James. He's 26 and a student at Cambridge. James suffers from depression, OCD and bulimia. I've had an eating disorder for nearly 10 years. I started with anorexia um, when I was about 15, 16. A binge could be 20 to 30,000 calories in one binge. I'm very lucky it could have been fatal and um, eating disorders have the highest mortality of any mental health problem. James got disability living allowance back in 2012. He used the money to pay for therapy and to live independently. But in February last year, he was told by the DWP he had to apply for the new personal independence payment. He was assessed by Capita. So what was the assessment process for personal independence payment like? We were looking at tasks um, like eating and preparing food and just whether I could do it physically. Physically, I can cook, so they assume that I have no problem with that. And I'm articulate and I can explain, look, psychologically, that's really difficult for me. It's distressing um, and I can't feed myself in a safe way. The way I feed myself causes me to have low potassium that can cause me to die. James was turned down for Pip, despite a long history of mental illness. Back at training in Birmingham, the company's chief medical officer tells Noel that in practice, the mental state exam isn't quite what it seems. Not a mental state exam as we see it. There's more than mental. It's like a mental health overview. So the difficulty is obviously it's being branded as a mental state exam and obviously you're looking so well hold and then certain bits that are missing and so you understand which aren't in there. Um, which obviously is very confusing. But you need to have some way of yeah. uh, quantifying the level of them they have. And that comes in, in the mental state. Noel is also told that the MSC is carried out without the claimant's knowledge. You don't tell them. Correct. But isn't that like saying you've been a little bit covert about it in some ways? Mm. It is, but, but unfortunately that's just the way, the way it works. And the problem is you're going to have to forget your, your mental health background in some respects and just park it to one side. Yeah. But the DWP told us that assessors are supposed to use their clinical knowledge as part of a holistic approach. The chief medical officer's uh, uh, statements about the mental state examination did surprise me. He said it was some sort of mental health overview, but it didn't seem to be some sort of mental health overview at all. We also asked Professor Jamie Hacker-Hughes the president of the British Psychological Society to review our secret filming. The mental state examination that I saw that's uh, included in the tests isn't what we consider a full mental state examination. It, it, it's an overview. Um, and I think yeah, that's, that's a characteristic, really, that you aren't getting that, that in-depth, detailed, specific, tailor-made assessment. The Department of Work and Pensions' own guidelines say assessments should be tailored to the individual. James appealed his decision and after six months was given a hearing. I went along and explained everything like I have to you now and I didn't tell them anything new. I just told them exactly what I'd put in my letter. Um, I explained about specifically about preparing food and about eating. 
and managing my mental health. And they unanimously agreed with me and overturned the decision. Capita told us that at no point did their chief medical officer suggest that assessments should be rushed, compromising quality. In part two, we meet the Capita assessor who boasts about the extraordinary money he's earned. Dispatches is investigating the personal independent payment benefit system, which sparked a row over the budget and led to the resignation of Ian Duncan Smith. Noel, our undercover assessor, has finished his training with Capita. Now he's been sent to learn the ropes from experienced employees in Northampton. Hi, Noel. Hi, Noel. Introduce you to Alan if you wanted to. Uh, Alan, who's the guy you'll be showing today. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Alan was um, considered to be well versed, well experienced. I think uh, to coin the phrase of many people of the staff who, when they talk about Alan, was that he was top of the top, top of the, the best of the best. I think that's how they framed him. I mean, Alan's had frequent updates since, yeah. and such like since he's been here. We had the training day only in January, so um, it's a very good DA actually. Alan, right. so yeah, he's yeah. a good person to sit with and learn from. Alan is a disability assessor. His job is to award points to decide whether disabled people will qualify for PIP. He says he's earned a lot of money doing it, especially during the contract's initial period in 2013. Money? I was going to have 20 grand a month, most months. They were paying double. They paid 80 pound assessment for the first eight assessments, then they paid 160 assessment for eight to 14, then they paid 300 pound assessment for 14 to 21. So imagine they're all banging them out very quickly then. Yeah, yeah we was flying from because of that money. Yeah. Grand a month. Noel's been trained to carry out one-to-one -one meetings to assess claimants, but Alan tells Noel that sometimes he completes his assessments before even meeting the claimant. Yeah. One claimant had lost a leg. So you think there's something significant as a leg missing would be, oh my God, there's some money, but when you get to the nuts and bolts of it, he does everything really, doesn't he? Yeah, he's very independent. Mm. Literally finished his assessment before I didn't walk through the door. I've done it on Saturday. Because you inform an observation with only one leg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's not going to claim that and then turn up with two legs. I was shocked, of course, by his attitude. It was notable that he thought he was a good assessor. And I'm not too sure that anybody else would agree with that. He represents both a failure of his own professional standards, but also a sort of problem in the system that is not somehow looking closely enough at the quality of that interview. Next, Alan talks to Noel about the use of informal observations, where the assessor watches the claimant but doesn't tell them the observations are part of the assessment. So do you catch them out with, with the, um, the informal obs then? Most of it's informal obs you catch them out with. So you don't tell them you're doing the informal obs then? No. No. You tell them you're doing informal observations, they'll watch what they're doing. Right. They're informal, that's why you don't have to say anything. Yeah, the trick is, honestly, is to watch them. Watch what they're doing, listen to everything they're saying. They'll tell you everything that they want to tell you is wrong. Um, but you can completely dismiss it loads, more often than not. What I think is disturbing about the way they were talking about the informal observations is they were not made clear to the claimant because there'd be no reason not to actually reveal that because the claimant might, may well have a good reason why and a decent explanation as to why there's a, a difference between what they're saying and what that person thinks they're observing. The Department of Work and Pensions told us that the informal observation of claimants are an important part of the consultation. The information held on Capita's computers is confidential and very sensitive. 
Yet Noel, on his second day, finds Alan using his phone to take shots of his computer screen. Hey, pictures up to mine. We asked Barrister Simon Butler about Alan's actions. It's quite clear there's been a breach of the Data Protection Act. There's been a clear breach of the patient's confidentiality because you're not entitled to take photographs of the patient's information. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, and for what I've seen, that would be a serious breach of his uh, professional standards. Twenty-eight-year-old Nikki was already receiving PIP for physical disabilities when she had a fall and banged her head, resulting in amnesia, which means every time she wakes up, she thinks it's October 2014, the day of her accident. What's life like suffering from such serious memory loss? I'm now without a job for the first time in 12 years, and, you know, I've not been at work for 14 months now, but... To me, you know, it's, it's, I've just had my normal day off and I was at work, you know, sort of like two nights ago, so it doesn't feel like I've, I've been off. Nikki and her partner notified the Department of Work and Pensions and were told she would have to be reassessed because of her changing circumstances. They did that towards the end of January. They, they came around and did the assessment. And then by April time, they said that she didn't meet the criteria and took it all away. So what was the reassessment like, Nikki? I don't know. You can't remember? You start to get Nick's down the stairs, and then they start asking you questions based on your mobility. There's really nothing in there about mental issues at all. Now that you're not getting PIP, how has this affected your finances? What does this mean for your family? It means I have to be very careful of what we spend and very creative sometimes of how we spend it. Getting PIP is kind of what meant that I could carry on working because getting that money meant that I could buy, like, sort of the knee and ankle supports and the wrist supports and things like that. Could you just tell me what it was like the day when you got the letter which said that you're not going to be getting PIP? Could not believe it. I was, I was sort of reading it and thinking, well, she's actually worse than she was before and now you're saying she doesn't meet the criteria. How is that even remotely possible? Nikki is now appealing the decision. Back in the clinic, our undercover trainee, Noel, is shadowing Alan, a disability assessor praised by his manager. Capita's glossy recruitment video is clear about the kind of people it wants to do this job. People who actually have an empathy with disabled people, have a understanding and, and a desire uh, to seek to improve the lives of disabled people. This is how Alan talks about some of the claimants. And he's happy to share his views with a manager. Now this is so fast, you can't work out. Claimants are told in their letters they can ask to record the assessments, but Noel spots a manager removing a notice telling claimants about that right. You're changing the uh, the rules. <laughs> Um, no, I'm just taking it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, actually. Just taking down the ID and the audio recording information. But we did have it on the notice boards, and we found that it was almost advertising the fact that we yeah. could do it, and we had new flux. So we're taking it down. Noel spent a total of 22 days filming undercover inside Capita. Capita told us. The comments and actions of Mr. Barham clearly fall short of what we expect and are totally unacceptable. We are obviously appalled by and sincerely apologise for this individual's disrespectful comments and actions. Mr. Barham will no longer work for Capita. 
In response to our evidence, Capita said, It is the DWP, not Capita, who makes the decisions on whether to award a benefit or not. Capita focuses on delivering to the DWP's requirements, while equally importantly, supporting and expecting all our assessors to treat every person sensitively and with respect. We will continue to review and refine the content and quality of our training and our work with disability organisations to ensure that we meet the needs of the DWP and treat people claiming this benefit appropriately. The DWP told us... We strongly refute these claims. The assessment process of PIP has been extensively reviewed to ensure it is robust. The claims process is as straightforward as possible and decisions are made based on the evidence. Since April 2013, just 5% of decisions have gone to appeal and only 2% of all PIP decisions have been overturned. We expect the highest standards from the contractors who carry out PIP assessments and work closely with them to ensure PIP is working in the best way possible. Ian Duncan Smith resigned over cuts to the new benefit he'd brought in to help the disabled. His successor admits the disabled were not always treated fairly. Behind every statistic, there is a human being. And perhaps, perhaps sometimes in government we forget that. The budget row may have shot Pip into the headlines, and those cuts may have been suspended, but this row is far from over. Nine o'clock tonight, the island with Bear Grylls, a battle for survival as a fishing mission turns treacherous. Tucking into a tale of eggs and raspberries before that, the food chain coming up. <laughs>